Hey guys, I'm Fancy. And I'm Colleen. And this is Murder by Design. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, so, nice to meet you. Um, I am so excited to talk with you. You have no idea. Like, I've been stalking you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew about you before HBO, just to be sure, just so you know I knew about you before that. But, okay. You know. <laughs> so. All right, so welcome, guys. I'm so Thank excited. You. We have a very special guest tonight. This is Paul Haynes. And so I can't even begin to tell you how exciting this is. Paul was one of the main researchers for Michelle McNamara in her um, quest to try and figure out who was the Golden State Killer and her book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark. So can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into that and, and how that happened and what you were doing before that kind of met, made you align with that whole thing? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, I've been following unsolved true crime, like serial murder cases uh, since around age 18. And mm -hmm. I think the case that initially hooked me was that of uh, John Edward Robinson. Do you remember that case in uh, Kansas City, I believe? Or is it like mm -hmm. Olith, Kansas? Kansas City yes. area? I do. I do remember it. Yes. Yeah. And what really struck me was the disconnect between um, his public persona as this mm -hmm. kind of pillar of the community and the fact that he mm -hmm. was a depraved serial murderer. Um, right. And, and that, that has been the hook for me all along particularly mm -hmm. with unsolved cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have uh, a phenomenon that yeah. is, is shaped by this mounting number of, of people being murdered by an unknown assailant. Mm -hmm. And as Michelle has discussed, you have a blank where the face and the name should be. And mm -hmm. there's just this, this compulsion to see that blank filled. Yeah. And yeah. I never really felt in following these cases, um, the need to get involved. Because uh, mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me like, especially at that time when, you know, true crime really wasn't a mainstream thing. Right. Uh, it, it didn't feel, it felt a little delusional to think that getting involved- You could do case, something. That I could do anything that law enforcement couldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the, the citizen has a disadvantage uh, in right. terms yeah. of the information that they have mm -hmm. access to. Right. Uh, but I just remember reading about the Green River Killer case back in 2000 before mm -hmm. it was solved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, there was a website called Crime Library, uh, mm -hmm. which did a big three-part piece on Green River case. And I remember thinking it's that truck painter. The truck painter is yes. the Green River Killer. Mm -hmm. and, and it turns out I was right. And certainly, mm -hmm. certainly that emboldened my, um, <laughs> my confidence in my, uh, you know, your, armchair. Your detective ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Don't I mean, ask with cats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think it was around like 2007 that I first learned about the original mm -hmm. Night Stalker crimes. And it was via right. um, an MSNBC Investigate special, mm -hmm. which had been initially broadcast in 2000. So that was before the links had been made to the Northern California series. Um, and, right. and during this time, I was just finishing up with college. And, and so my true crime interest was in like kind of a valley. And uh, I kind of put it in a drawer and forgot about it. And then yeah. like a year later, uh, I was thinking about, you know, unsolved serial murder cases. In fact, I have mm -hmm. this book. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it um, as literature, uh, but it's this book called Still at Large, a case book of 20th century serial killers who eluded justice. The author is a man named Michael Newton. I, um, I have that one. I think I have that one. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I have so many that I don't even read all of them, but I have, yeah. I think I do have that one. Yeah. Now, so it, it, I mean, I have to say, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps I should exercise more caution when when mm -hmm. critically speaking critically about other writers, but right. it's not an especially well researched or written book. Mm -hmm. But that said, it's an A to Z collection of unsolved serial murder cases. Right. And I was looking through the book, and this book was published in. I think 1999. Mm -hmm. And so this is roughly like 2008, 2009. And I'm looking up these cases to see which had been solved since this book was published. And in fact, right. some, of them had, some of them had been solved before the book was published, years before. So, mm -hmm. um, you mm -hmm. know, and I, 
I, I, giving the, the writer the benefit of the doubt, um, in the late 90s, we had access to fewer resources in terms of yeah. like, news uh, archives. Yeah. Newspapers so, at the library. Yeah. Right. But then I started thinking about- <laughs> yeah, microfiche. I love micro microfiche. I, I do too. I still love it. It's still yeah. one of my favorite ways to research. Yeah. So uh, I just yeah. love film in general. And I, do uh, too. I hope that it never mm -hmm. truly goes away. But that's a right. tangent, perhaps reserved mm. for the bonus features. Um, <laughs> so uh, I started thinking about that case I had heard about on MSNBC like a year mm -hmm. or two prior. Mm -hmm. And the details were a little fuzzy by that point. But I went to Google because I couldn't find any case resembling it in this book. Um, right. I don't think actually, you know what, he may have, mm, I, there was another book that he published in which he may have written about the Goleta series, because that, that's the only series in Southern California during the time that these crimes were, were fresh that was yeah. recognized as a series, but Santa Barbara mm -hmm. did not think that they were linked to these other crimes. They had been contacted by other jurisdictions and they right. refuted a link. In fact, Santa Barbara refuted a link all the way up until 2011, when DNA finally, wow. it was this is the last DNA connection that had been made in this series, linked um, one of the crimes, uh, it was Domingo Sanchez, to original ice soccer. And at that point, Santa Barbara, I guess, conceded that, oh yeah, it's the same offender. <laughs> See, <but because laughs> DNA it, seems, matches. it seems so obvious to me, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what investigators were oh, thinking, sure. so. Yeah, well, they yeah. were fixated. I mean, investigators get like tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right. John, John Douglas has, has written about this and he coined this term mm -hmm. linkage blindness to describe right. how investigators will not see links where links very obviously exist. I, right. And I think the opposite problem exists in the amateur community where there's like this linkage mania. Yes. And when I was posting on the uh, A&E forum, uh, there mm -hmm. was this one gentleman who, uh, he, he, he insisted that the original, the Easter rapist, original ice soccer was, was also the Zodiac killer. The person who tells me that too. And I'm like, I don't see it. I'm sorry. And, I don't see yeah. it. And, and he, <laughs> he insisted that it was Ted Kaczynski. And he, he posited Ted Kaczynski as responsible for the Atlanta child murders, uh, for the Chicago Tylenol poisonings. Basically, oh any unsolved murder <laughs> series in the United States must have been. Ted yeah, Kaczynski. Have been. Ted Kaczynski. And, and, he, and he would post these, like, compendiums of, like, uh, uh, oh photographic, you know, evidence to, to bolster his, you no. know, to prove his theory. Um, so you see a lot of that in the amateur community, and I think that it's mm -hmm. rooted in, like, um, just just uh, fanciful thinking about crime that, mm -hmm. that I, I yeah. largely was shaped by like 80s and 90s serial killer movies and TV like Silence of the Lambs mm -hmm. where the serial mm -hmm. killer is the super villain. Roger Ebert right. wrote a review, I think it was a, of like Kiss the Girls or Fallen or one of those like late mm -hmm. 90s serial mm -hmm. killer movies in which mm -hmm. he was talking about a scene where the killer has like a room with thousands of candles all lit and he was like, we never see the scene where they're actually going to the store to buy those candles. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and the reality of these offenders is that they're banal. And that's how they're able to right. kind of just blend right. in. Um, it's, funny that so, you, it's funny that you mentioned that because I have a crime drama that I wrote, I've written about serial killers. And that was one of the conversations we had in our writer's room mm -hmm. just recently was, okay, so we've got all these things but we need to see the daily activities of these people that still yeah. move the move the story along, but yet you've got to see them all just being people too, That's right? That's the most otherwise, interesting like, thing to Right, because what yes. do they do in their daily life? How do they maintain this, this weirdness? Yeah. And then the other side is the police officers that are pursuing this. So in my series, it's it's a serial killers and then it's the, the police officers and it's, just, it's yeah. this thing about the two families. Well, sure. the police officers, it's a whole family of police officers. So we wanted to see the daily life of them too and yeah. how the effect of not solving a murder for all these years was affecting right. this whole family. So, yeah. but I think it's funny that you bring it up. Like, like they don't, yeah, you sure. never see them going to get the candles. Cause we yes. had this conversation right. that this yeah. was well, important. I, <laughs> I agree that knowing about the, uh, serial killer is so interesting that they are like a normal person. Yeah. Like, right. you know, Ted and Bundy, think, like, daytime normal. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, and yeah. I think that like movies from like the 80s and 90s and early 2000s about serial killers, um, they impose these kind of like arcane uh, belief systems and this like symbolism and you know yeah. where well this represents this and and people in the the armchair community have like applied that that um, <laughs> template to real life yeah. serial murders and like right. with with the uh, our series 
Um, mm -hmm. You had uh, evidence like uh, some of the victims of Southern California, uh, there were balls of fiber that were found, like tufts of fiber, or balls of fiber that were found on their backs post-mortem. And one of the oh, wow. police reports uh, or one of the materials that they had obtained used the verb sprinkled to suggest that this was deliberate. Now, you know, uh, mm. law enforcement uh, generally uh, is not populated by wordsmiths and sometimes <laughs> they, they use words carelessly and then you have people in the armchair <laughs> community who just use those words like, like, uh, like gospel. Mm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the, the problem, I think one problem with education, at least in America, is we are conditioned to, uh, oh, sorry, I should have silenced my phone. That's okay. <laughs> uh, we are conditioned to uh, look at literature um, my recording, it stopped my recording. I'm gonna start again. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna put this on you, do not disturb him. I'm so sorry, no I should have done you're that. You're okay, no, you're fine. So, it happens to the best of us. I'm not yeah. even sure I silenced mine, let me make sure. <laughs> you know, in, in, this, in this age of quarantine, watching CNN, I hear people's like notifications go off all the time. Yes. And I think yes. it's mine, and then I look at my phone, I'm disappointed I'm like, no. that it was on the TV. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. What I was talking about, oh yeah, so um, there's this problem I think in, in like uh, English classes across the country mm -hmm. where you know we're, mm -hmm. we're conditioned to interpret literature in this mathematical left brain way where yeah. oh, well this represents this, this is a symbol. Yes. Symbolism, symbolism does not, mm, no. And many yeah. times, like I, I'm serious, I and I, I, I am a, I'm an English person, okay? I do much better with literature than I do with math and things like that. I mean, I'm okay with math. I'm not an idiot, but yeah. I, you know, but I'm very, you know, much in the literature thing. And when we were doing those those stories, and the like, the teachers are like the symbolism, and I'm like, I don't get it. I don't see it. I don't see what you're seeing. I don't know well, what so you're seeing. I don't see this. I'm, <laughs> I'm the young one, so I'm 25. I'll be 26 in a couple months. And so when I was in high school school we had to read um or middle school we had to read spite fences and like the entire book our teacher made us do an assignment every single week about what is the symbolism from this chapter what is the symbolism well the author then came to speak to us and we asked him it was that symbolism he's like i put no symbolism in the book it meant nothing yeah I <laughs> think writers, sometimes yeah. i do for sure but not all the time sometimes he's i'm like, just no. writing you know? really Nope. It takes the joy out of reading, yeah. and it, it suggests that there's a right way to interpret it when yes. that's the opposite of how you should enjoy yes. literature. It, yes. it's, you have the freedom to interpret it any way you want. And certainly yeah. the author often has intentions, but yeah. I think that symbols represent feelings more than they represent um, specific items. And yeah. Well, like when people read Harry Potter, like, and, you know, they were, Dumbledore was gay, and they're like, no, he's not. And it's like, J.K. Rowling's like, yeah, he is. I wrote the book. Yeah. But they're like, nope, right. nope, la la la, I can't hear you. That's not true. <laughs> Back when we assumed J.K. Rowling was progressive on the issue. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> she has to get off that hill. I don't know what's going on. He's dying on that hill. Ooh, but, that but going back to symbolism, I think, you know, that kind of conditioning has, has uh, emerged in the armchair sleuth community where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I think he sprinkled the balls of fiber on the victims because he was saying something about oh, for the nature. Love of God. And yes, it, yes. It's, it's a, you know, I reject mm -hmm. that kind of thinking. I, I've always applied mm -hmm. just pragmatic, mm -hmm. practical, optimist yes. razor. Yep. Like, that's, what's that's the true. simplest explanation for why this is here? Right. Um, because the so, simplest is generally the answer. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Think, think horse feet not zebras right yeah yeah not zebras. yeah that's, that's you know a, it's like so it. we did you know we did we and we talk about this all the time we did four years of researching on the gypsy rose blanchard case worked with the family mm. worked with yeah. gypsy did a crazy story um and we went through hell Tragic. for the last last year and a half okay it is just and and everything that anybody thinks they know about that case they totally don't know um but we had a lady who would, would sit there and try to make like all these connections that just weren't there. And I'm like, yeah. ma'am, I am looking at these documents that you don't have. I'm telling you right now, that's not true. And then she would make these ludicrous statements of like, oh, well, there's seven surgeries that are the exact same surgery. So, you know, she didn't have 37 surgeries or whatever. She only had, one, so those seven, I'm only gonna count it as one surgery and that's it. I'm like, ma'am, it doesn't work that way. If you go in for seven surgeries, whether it's one- that's seven, you know, seven surgeries. Seven surgeries, seven, you seven don't count it as given one. Anesthesia. Yeah. Right. I'm like, you don't get to go to the doctor's office seven times for the same thing and say, oh, I only went to the doctor once. But right. No, <laughs> so you're getting billed every single time. Sure. Right? Absolutely. I, I think that I think people want to be 
the one to see something that no one else saw. Yes, they want to be yes. like in Goodwill Hunting when he solves a math problem in the classroom. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, How do you like new apples, right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's purely narcissistic. Uh, yeah, but yes, so yeah. yeah, getting back to uh, Santa Barbara, um, mm-hmm. they insisted that their series wasn't related, and they they wanted mm-hmm. to pin the crimes on this this local thug named Brett Glassby, who died right. in 1983. And so he couldn't have been the original line soccer because that offender also killed Janelle Cruz in 1986. Right. Um, but then, you know, in 2011, it was established that, well, yeah, these were all the work of the same offender. Yeah, so yeah. I think that, excuse me, um, I think it was in 2010, mm-hmm. um, I had been casually like poking around into this uh, case for a while. And I think I had transitioned from lurker on the a and forum to <laughs> contributor. Uh, it was just a great repository for information that was unavailable yeah. anywhere else. And right. I was working at the time for like this kind of like a shady law firm that this the law firm. So the law firm, they specialized in, I was a legal assistant. It was just a mick mm-hmm. job. Uh, I was right. like fresh out of college. I had a film degree, which is useless in most states. <laughs> yes, um, I know. I, I, have, I have a film high degree. among those states. And, I, um, I'm one of those film people too. So I understand. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. And if you don't get your film degree from like, you know, UCLA or NYU or USC, it's nothing. It's nothing. As an um, actor, if you don't go to go to um, actor studio uh, right, for a BS, you know, or for your, yeah, no, they don't care. It yeah. doesn't matter. Yeah. So, um, uh, it, I, it was a law firm that specialized in uh, foreclosure cases and it would, oh, you know, wow. it would represent people whose homes are going to foreclosure. Oh, but geez. then they had this other business called uh, quicksale.com where they would sell homes that had gone into foreclosure. Oh. So they were using a law firm. I didn't know this. <laughs> yet. I, uh, only later, once like government officials showed up at the other place, um, did I realize, oh, something shady is, is happening here. Yes. And, uh, so, but, so they were uh, having these people agree to have their homes sold on quicksale.com. So it was just like, I don't wow. know, it was, it was, it was really, mm-hmm. but it's Florida. Florida yeah. is a drain for that kind of person yeah. and for those kind of ethics. And uh, it's interesting so, uh, that you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I, that place, the law firm ended up shutting down. I found myself unemployed, moved back home with my parents at 28, which, which was very depressing for me. Uh, yeah. Because that's the last place I wanted to be. As yeah. my family is very dysfunctional and right. um you know there's still a lot of there was a lot of unresolved damage and mm-hmm. trauma so to go back in that environment was uh sure. i felt defeated and yeah. i found myself isolating um and i think just instinctually as a means of avoiding feeling and not experiencing my depression um i i incrementally drifted into this. And this is something that I'd begun doing while I was working for this law firm. Um, sure. I found myself with hours and hours of downtime, tucked mm-hmm. away in a cubby with no uh, room for anyone to look over my shoulder. Mm-hmm. And I found myself going on to like classmates.com and looking at yearbooks and looking at uh, public records resources and finding, looking specifically for men born between a certain range of years, 1940 mm-hmm. and 1960, who had mm-hmm. lived in the same places that this person offended because this a person right. this person this offender uh, was active in very specific places during specific right. windows of time that suggested mm-hmm. to me via that lens of Occam's razor that he was living in some or all of these places during these right. these time frames sure. Uh, sure especially Sacramento it's not like and a truck driver driving through or anything no, like that no no right, because right. there's it's not a chaotic random right. Uh, right. Uh, disbursement or uh, dispersal of uh, of um, of crimes. They're right. clustered in specific places at specific did times. You, did you ever think it was going to be a police officer at some, at any oh, point? We cons- yeah, time? we absolutely considered it. And we were aware uh-huh. that they considered it at the time in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. I think that mm-hmm. all of Sacramento's, uh, Sacramento County and Sacramento City, their police mm-hmm. were looked at as suspects right. and asked to give saliva samples. I, there oh, was wow. a screening process. But of course, mm-hmm. as we know now, D'Angelo did not work for Sacramento PD or Sheriff's right. Department. He was up in Auburn. Um, right. Hi- hindsight, you know. Uh, yeah, but funny. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. flash funny. forward, I'm living at home and I'm finding myself doing this more and more and more, spending most of my mm-hmm. time doing it because I felt like I'm very good at this and there's a lot of resources out there that I can mm-hmm. use and, mm-hmm. and cleverly find a way to implement in the development of potential suspects. And it was like five or six months in that I connected with Michelle on the a wow. forum. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, yeah. So what was that like? Because um, she's just an amazing, amazing 
person, oh, yeah. did amazing things. And, and uh, how, how, what was that connection like and how did that kind of come together to be that you're going to be her lead researcher on all of this? So we connected on the forum and, uh, you know, when you connect with new people on these forums, um, oftentimes, like I would send a private message to someone who, someone would pop up on the forum and say, yeah, I have a POI, person of interest, who mm -hmm. lived in all the right places at all the right times and he did this and he did this and, uh, you know, uh, um, and they would like tease you with this is potentially the perpetrator. So I would like contact them privately and then they would mm -hmm. be very reticent and they'd maybe surrender some initials and, uh, mm -hmm. and then I would be mm -hmm. able to figure out just on the basis of initials and a birth year who it was. Um, right. And with Michelle, that reticence uh, dissipated very quickly because mm -hmm. one of the people she had shared with me, I had already come across and I responded with mm -hmm. his year, his high school yearbook, his senior uh, portrait. I was like, yeah, I already oh, looked wow. into him and already eliminated him. And I think we saw that we were doing very similar work and thinking mm -hmm. about the case very similarly. Um, and we developed a rapport almost immediately and we're, we're corresponding on a daily basis. Uh, we met, mm -hmm. I think in the, the following year, she was visiting her father in South Florida where he lived. And uh, around that time she began working on the LA Magazine piece. And she wrote about me in the piece. I wrote a supplement for the online edition of it. It ran and uh, shortly after it ran, she sold the book to Harper Collins, and that's when mm -hmm. she called me with the news and invited me to be her researcher. So that is so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. So you guys get into this, and you're working, and um, you know, she, you're. So how does it end up? So the book is not 100% finished when Michelle tragically passes away, right? That's right. Yeah. So then it's up to you. And I think it was uh, Billy Jensen, right? Yeah. And, and, and Patton, obviously, her husband, yeah. Patton, to finish this. How did, that, how did you guys decide that that's what you were going to do? Mm -hmm. And where, what happened? How did you feel when you started doing that? Was it, was it something you were proud of or were you very sad? How, kind of a, well, it was a, it was a combination? It's a mixture of things, yeah. I mean, when I first learned about Michelle's death, it was the afternoon uh, of, of the morning that it happened. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, an utter shock. Uh, right. It was the last thing that, that I had anticipated. And it, it took a day for it to fully digest. Um, mm -hmm. And it, had, it took about a day also for it to hit the news cycle. So once it hit the news cycle, that's when the reality of it really set in for me. And it was right. devastating. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also, I didn't know what the fate of the book would be. And mm -hmm. that was my primary source of, uh, of income. Mm -hmm. So there was also my own financial security that, uh, that I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. And it was a very hard weekend. And then on sure. Sunday, three days after she passed, uh, Patton's assistant had reached out to me, uh, just to let mm -hmm. me know that Patton was intent on making sure the book was finished. And mm -hmm. they had been contacted by this, this uh, journalist named Billy Jensen, uh, who mm -hmm. knew Michelle. Um, and mm -hmm. he and uh, another writer named Steve Huff would be helping me uh, right. complete the book. Steve ultimately, wow. um, unfortunately, his sister died shortly after Michelle. And he's on the oh East Coast, goodness. so he, mm -hmm. um, he ultimately did not uh, participate, and that's a shame. But yeah. Billy and I worked on the uh, sorting the materials, and uh, mm -hmm. I had Michelle's uh, her laptop and some of her other physical materials. And then mm -hmm. um, as they were uh, 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 clearing out some of her stuff, mm -hmm. I was contacted about by one of her friends about the materials we had borrowed from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. We had borrowed... Right. Uh, 37 boxes of police files um, mm -hmm. from the OCSD. And these were files that had been uh, sitting in a closet untouched, yeah. collecting dust for years. Like once Larry Poole retired, um, that, that case mm -hmm. wasn't being given a lot of yep. attention from the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Mm -hmm. So some controversy has kind of uh, um, bubbled up intermittently since that's happened with respect to mm -hmm. Michelle and I borrowing those materials. There was a piece recently in some uh, alternative publication called The Voice of Orange County uh, about mm -hmm. how the chain of custody was broken. And I was contacted by um, someone with the Orange County Defender's Office uh, who tricked me into answering some questions that it, 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 the information is already out there. But wow. uh, my name my name was, uh, I was quoted in a, like a court deposition. Um, <laughs> So he's trying to make an issue of this to discredit the OCSD um, because he's uh, defending a convicted murder and sex offender. Uh, nice. It's not exactly a, a position that I am interested in buttressing, uh, but yeah. I did so unwittingly to some minor extent. But 
you know, wow. I, I think that there is value. And I think that this, that's what this case exemplifies. There's great mm -hmm. value to law enforcement um, selectively with, you know, uh, discretion, um, uh, collaborating with, with private individuals, if those individuals yeah. have proven mm -hmm. themselves to be trustworthy yeah. and to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, adding value or merit to their investigation. And sure. yeah. so yeah. we had these materials, which is an exciting acquisition that again, in hindsight, uh, was purely a red herring because D'Angelo's name wasn't anywhere in any of the files. He never had any contact wow. with police as far as we know. Uh, but it was still um, uh, a, it was still a tremendous acquisition. And there were a lot of mm -hmm. other subsidiary lingering mi mysteries and misconceptions that we were able to resolve by looking through that material because this investigation was so fragmented as you had mm -hmm. seven or eight different jurisdictions at least right. working these cases that there were, there were items among those materials that Paul Holes had never seen, that Ken Clark mm -hmm. in Sacramento had never seen. So mm -hmm. I mean, we were doing a service to the investigation right. by pulling it all cat together, cataloging it and digitizing mm -hmm. it and sharing it with yep. everyone. Um, yeah. That fragmentation and lack of interjurisdictional cooperation uh, was mm -hmm. something that had plagued this case for decades. And yes. one of Michelle's objectives was to resolve that and unify these jurisdictions. And she, mm -hmm. ha she held an investigators, a homicide investigators uh, summit dinner in, uh, I believe it was 2015, bringing key investigators from all of these jurisdictions together in Santa Barbara just for wow. a dinner. And she was uh, um, significantly interested in facilitating communication cooperation you know, between these jurisdictions. And certainly we're in an age now where um, that insular, um, ego-driven, proprietary attitude toward a case has abated somewhat. And I think jurisdictions yeah. are a little more sure. open to reaching mm -hmm. out laterally and working with mm -hmm. other jurisdictions. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we've seen in, in this case. So- Do you right. think that in, they didn't do that at the time because it was, you know, less, you know, trust between the jurisdictions and not working together at, you know, in general at that time or just I, I think it's it was better now that it was? I suspected it was ego driven. I think that, you know, law mm -hmm. enforcement is a predominantly male uh, yeah. um, field. Um, sure. And, these are men that are tough guys and yeah. a lot of them were, you know, probably athletes in, in high school. And I, I don't mean to very generalize, very, but, no, very competitive, but they're competitive and, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. ego driven. And so right. I think that that, I, I think the culture has, has grown somewhat, I don't want to say progressive because it's certainly not if this year has, has uh, shown us anything. Um, right. But I think that, it has moved somewhat in that direction. On the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, uh, during that process of, of helping finish uh, uh, Patton, working with Patton to finish the book, um, I took all of his materials into my home and mm -hmm. I digitized uh, everything that we had to digitize, which we had only digitized maybe, you know, 20% of it, if that, oh, at wow. the time that Michelle oh, passed. Oh, that's a lot. So, oh, my and goodness. it was, it was not, it was a chore, I'll tell you that. Um, I don't mm -hmm. like working with paper. I don't like paper cuts. I don't like removing staples and resecuring them. It's not something I enjoy doing. We had the same thing because we had all of uh, Gypsy's medical records mm -hmm. and all the files that we had to put into a drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many. And we're documents. talking thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper. I have. Oh sure, yeah. Like like you can't see it, but you can. See, well, I'll turn just a little bit so you guys can see. So. That back there, mm -hmm. you see all the, the binders, and yeah. then there's stacks of papers, and there's another yeah. binder under. That is I see all there, just see buckling a little bit. Yes, that is all <laughs> just pieces of of medical records. That's like mm -hmm. nothing else, and that's not even yeah. near like I don't even think that's like them. a quarter of them. Like mm -hmm. it's not yeah. even a quarter, and it's like just <laughs> outrageous amounts of, of information. Yeah. And then I've got just so many more digitized, you know, but. Um, yeah. Digital it, is, is, I mean, at least with, with like stuff like this is so much. Yeah, so much it is. But then, and, and but you, then it, there's, there's something to be said for holding it in your hand though and kind of looking through it and, and checking things off and making yeah. notes and things like that too, you know? Yeah, so, there's always that tactile yeah. reward 
but yeah. with, with digital, you know, if you want to find something, just yes. spotlight search, control F, right. and there it is mm -hmm. in a matter of right, like seconds. Right. Right. Well, yeah. We had to put together like a whole spreadsheet of like, this is in this file and this mm -hmm. is in that file because now we're writing a book, you know, and uh, doing the same thing of like, like what you're saying, you know, you have to go through and process everything and what do I need? What do I don't need? What is relevant? What is irrelevant? You know, the information. So it's completely, we totally understand what you're saying with that. So now you digitize everything. How far into research though, and really kind of putting together a whole thing were you when Michelle passed? We were pretty far into it. Um, okay. We had, among the materials that, that we had borrowed from the mm -hmm. OCSD were the Ventura file, Lyme, Lyman and Charlene Smith, um, mm -hmm. additional Visalia, the whole Visalia investigation, um, mm -hmm. stuff we had never seen. And this was sure. like, we felt it was key, key uh, uh, material. Um, mm -hmm. Ventura turned out not to be that, that whole, it was like basically 6,000 pages of nothing because they right. didn't really, they didn't really entertain the possibility that they were murdered by a stranger. They focused mm -hmm. exclusively mm -hmm. on their social circles. Um, right. and you can't entirely impugn them for that. that. Right. Uh, right. It's common. That's yeah. But right. you, they just got stuck in that kind of nu nu nucleus and didn't yeah. really venture beyond it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. you saw that with Janelle Cruz as well. I mean, Janelle right. Cruz is someone who, um, at the time that she was murdered, she um, had been dating multiple men, and mm -hmm. then there were men that, that were interested in dating her, that, that who's mm -hmm. interested she didn't reciprocate. So there were a lot of suspects um, just in her inner circle. Uh, but again, um, it was all just a red herring. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, you know, looking, looking at these cases, I think we asked ourselves, um, because in many serial murder cases, you find once the perpetrator is, is identified that not, maybe there was one or two victims that he could have been directly connected to. Like if Dennis Rader, mm -hmm. for instance, BTK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So when, when Rader resurfaced um, mm -hmm. and began communicating with law enforcement with like cereal boxes and East. dolls or whatever he was doing, um, he, he took credit for an additional murder. The murder of, yeah. uh, I believe the victim's name was Vicki Weggerly. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a murder in Wichita in the mid 80s that had never been connected to BTK. Up until right. that point, it was assumed that BTK series ended um, in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. So he took credit for this one additional murder. But then mm -hmm. when he was arrested, the, there were these two other murders that it was Dolores Davis and Mar mm -hmm. Maureen Hedge. Mm -hmm. And Maureen Hedge was his neighbor, lived two houses down. Right. Now, if he had taken responsibility for Marine Hedge during that period where he was communicating and taunting law enforcement, communicating mm -hmm. with and taunting law enforcement, um, it, it's likely that would have led to him. Um, right. Because yeah. I, I'm sure he was questioned sure. during that right. investigation. I'm sure right. they did a canvas. So uh, I assume wow. that with Ear, with uh, Iran's Golden State Killer, so many monikers this guy's had. I know, uh, I know. I know. That <laughs> this, might, this might be the case with him as well. But as far as we know, that's, that's, not, that's mm -hmm. not the case. Um, so do you think there's more um, more victims that, that we just don't know about with him? Maybe sexual assault victims. There were some victims mm -hmm. that were taken off the official list or kind of right. in the yellow zone during the 70s. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't think there's any, there are any other homicides that, that he's committed. Maybe, I, I, I mean, I doubt it. Right. I thought like, when I so when I was doing some research on this case, this is one that I didn't totally follow. I've got other cases that I follow more, um, but I was surprised that you know thirteen deaths, but over fifty rapes, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, that he let some people live and let others not live. And yeah. I just don't the I think, minds I think of these people. I think D'Angelo um, followed a very tight script. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the uh, the rape victims who uh, um, would, would describe their interactions with him, a lot of them said he spoke in this measured way that said it was like he was reading a script. Um, I think that he had a very, um, I'm looking at your lamp. I have the same exact, same exact oh. lamp in my apartment. <laughs> See, over there. <laughs> um, uh, I got a target. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> I, I, so I think that, he needed complete control over every crime. Yeah. And that's why he stuck mm -hmm. to the script. Uh, right. He didn't want to veer off the script. And right. so you'll see there were, there were instances where he uh, uh, tied up a victim and then ended up leaving without sexually assaulting the victim. In one instance, mm -hmm. there was a, a group of noisy teenagers uh, outside on the street corner and he kept going to the window 
to look out at them. And I think that derailed him and he ultimately left. Um, right. That happened in a few, a few of the mm-hmm. cases. So mm-hmm. uh, once he began killing though, that was his thing. He, Do you uh, think it was always going to evolve to killing? Like if there was no chance. Oh, I think so. with this offender. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. With D'Angelo. Yeah. 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 I, think I think that so. uh, it was inevitable. Right. I mean, he had well, murdered in Visalia in, in 75 mm-hmm. and then he murdered again in 77 mm-hmm. in Sacramento. Um, right. So right. he'd already crossed that line. Uh, yeah. But in both of those instances, it was um, uh, uh, self-preservation. Mm-hmm. Um, a- after the couple in Goleta uh, managed to break free of him from that mm-hmm. point forward, um, that was the justification. I mean, Paul Holes has talked about this. Uh, yeah. From a profiling standpoint, it, it checks mm-hmm. out. Um, yeah. And so with Offerman Manning, and Offerman broke free of his bindings and, and lunged at, uh, the, the evidence of the scene suggested this, lunged at D'Angelo, and, and that's when mm-hmm. Offerman was shot. Um, and also Greg Sanchez, uh, several crimes later, had, had, it's funny how everything in Goleta went awry for him, but <laughs> yeah. everywhere else it was tightly controlled. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what was most important for D'Angelo. Mm-hmm. I think D'Angelo, um, he made himself the master of these people and the master mm-hmm. of their houses. He became the man of the house. That was his right. fantasy. He was a domestic right. terrorist. And so mm-hmm. the ultimate um, uh, realization of that fantasy is mm-hmm. exactly what you see in uh, Ventura and Orange County. Right, right. Do you think that the, w- witnessing the rape of his sister and having to be forced to do that at the age of nine um, really contributed to how he yeah. Absolutely. He put, he did this. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, yeah. yeah. It seems I don't think like that we, alone. I don't think that alone did it. Yeah, I think, it, I think oh, it contributed right. in, in his methodology though, of how controlled he had to be, because mm-hmm. I thought, I think like that put into his Learned psyche, that was control. probably a break, you know, in his, yeah. that he had to sit and watch that. So I feel like that's how he made the men once he crossed over to doing couples, because originally yeah. he didn't start with that, you know, that that's was right. almost as if the cops like dared him to do that. And he was like, oh, hold my beer, you know, like, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, oh, okay, I haven't done anything with a man in the house or yeah. a dog in the house. Yeah, yeah, all right, I see you. I'm, I'm yeah. going to do, okay. And that, you well, know, right. it's, it's, it's the but, control. When, yeah. Like for our channel, it's murder by design. And so we talk about what creates the mind of these people who then commit these crimes. And right. a lot of times, I think we just talked about it in um, the Oakland County child killer, mm-hmm. that a lot of times the perpetrator who is doing the crime was abused or molested as a child. And then there's, you know, they feel out of control. And when they're older, they want to be in control. Mm-hmm. And then they go on to do horrible, horrible things. I think it's always, it's almost invariably the case where you will find some element of recurrent child abuse. I think that serial murder is a manifestation of unresolved trauma. And I was abused as a child. And so I am, I'm very defensive with new people. I find new people Mm -hmm. and strangers very threatening. And Mm -hmm. so one thing that I've had to work on for a long time is I'm a very confrontational person. And um, I think that being confrontational with strangers, I am projecting uh, maybe my primary abuser's uh, personality onto that person. And I'm trying to move on to the other side, uh, the right side of abuse, where of the abuse that I suffered as a child, where I'm in Mm -hmm. control. Um, And I think that that's what you see. uh, And I like most people who are abused as children don't don't become serial serial killers. Right. That's, no, that's it it's, a, it's a rare confluence of multiple factors. You have to have. Yeah, yes. uh, that's not the only factor that contributes. There are no, other but things. It, it's a significant. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think. Yeah. I think. It is a um, significant. Uh, uh, a a uh, great reference point in the real world uh, in terms of like a psychopath who has acknowledged he's a psychopath and mm-hmm. I mean, he's, has actually contributed to the world instead of uh, subtracting from it is um, uh, what is his name? James Fallon. Uh, James Fallon is, I I think I'm getting his first name right. James Fallon is a neuroscientist who has studied the brains of um, criminal, violent offenders. Yeah. That that was Mm -hmm. primarily what his career was. And Mm -hmm. um, he had had recognized fundamental structural differences in the brains Mm -hmm. of of some of these violent offenders in the Mm -hmm. brains of psychopaths. Yeah, right. Um, you could distinguish the brain of a psychopath from the mm-hmm. brain of a normal person. Mm-hmm. And uh, flash forward, I don't know, like a decade into this this research or whatever, he was um, 
he was doing some other uh, other work uh, in uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, and he was looking mm -hmm. at brain scans of mm -hmm. um, his family uh, right. to determine um, like if there were any like markers that, that might pr be predictors of, of Alzheimer's. And yeah. one of the brain scans was it was the brain of a psychopath. He was like, oh, this mm -hmm. must have gotten mixed up from my other you know my other research. And mm -hmm. it, but then it turned out it was his own brain. Right. And he uh, realized that he had the brain of a psychopath. And so he, he uh, shared this with his colleagues and none of them was surprised. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, you're vindictive. You hold grudges like time bombs right. for years right. where you think the right, grudges right. are resolved and then suddenly, yeah. Um, but James Fallon ha had grown up in a very large and supportive and loving, nurturing family. And so, you know, he became a productive, functioning yes. member of society exactly. Exactly. instead of a mm -hmm. destructive mm -hmm. one. Uh, right. So I think with, with D'Angelo, you have um, the abuse, which, which mm -hmm. uh, from what I've read, um, mm -hmm. his father would lock D'Angelo and his siblings in a closet. Mm -hmm. And this is information in uh, the a book that just uh, uh, was released by James Huddle, who was his brother-in-law. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I've read D'Angelo, his father would lock the, fa the siblings and, and uh, the children in a closet, and then mm -hmm. he would open the closet and one by one beat them. Um, that's pretty yeah. severe abuse and that is, combined yeah. with the, the sexual wiring. Right. Um, you mm -hmm. know, you have the perfect storm. Yes. And I think what, what really sets D'Angelo apart mm -hmm. from other offenders, mm -hmm. I mean, most, most of these offenders, they do take the path of least resistance. And that was <laughs> my, the, that was the um, incorrect assumption I was making and looking at this case. <laughs> I mean, I recognize that, that, that this was a, an offender who did take a lot of risks and a lot of chances, but generally there are ways in which offenders do take the path of least resistance. And that's why a yeah. lot of offenders, a lot of serial offenders will target sex workers because they are the most yeah. vulnerable. Sex yeah. workers, people that are homeless, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the lowest hanging The children fruit. can't talk. That's yeah, the, right. lowest, the lowest hanging fruit, right? Yeah. Like you said, yeah. Mm -hmm. D'Angelo, again and again, liked to challenge himself. Mm -hmm. and make it hard for himself and take mm -hmm. risks. And, and he was, mm -hmm. like many psychopaths, an adrenaline junkie. And he got right. off on that danger. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he chose homes with dogs present. Uh, he tacked one uh, couple in, I think it was Fremont, where the man, like his biceps were so massive that D'Angelo triple tied his hands, like really, like, like with a degree of security that you didn't see in any of the other cases. Um, right. But it, it that was that was the the thrill for him is mm -hmm. is stepping up the um, mm -hmm. the challenge and the risk. Right now, did his name ever come up as you were you guys were researching, or did it first come out when he was arrested? First came out when he was arrested. The closest we came, wow. and if we didn't recognize this at, at the time, but looking at so what Michelle would do with the um, the DNA markers that she had is she would upload them to like genealogical databases, but mm -hmm. ones that were not as um, complete as mm -hmm. as, as uh, GEDmatch, uh, like Y Search mm -hmm. was one of them, and so it basically mm -hmm. would give her like um, uh, surnames that he might have, or like sure. he, he might be from this region. Mm -hmm. And like mm -hmm. most of, most of, and this was even before Michelle and I uh, were working on this case, most of the DNA analyses indicated Northwestern European ancestry, specifically British Isles, uh, mm -hmm. which I mean, it, nothing indicated Italian ancestry. Uh, but then there was like one departure thread where uh, it suggested ancestry in the Azores, which is an island mm -hmm. off the coast, coast of uh, Portugal or series of islands off the right. uh, coast of Portugal. And one of the names was De Silva, and another of the names was Angelo. Um, oh, wow. That's, that's the closest that, that I think we came to mm -hmm. this guy, but it still seemed, I mean, it, it, it was, it was a reach. Italian. It, it, yeah, Absolutely, reach. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So why do you think, even with all of what you guys did uncovered and everything, why do you think you never hit him? I mean, just seriously. He wasn't living in Sacramento in the 1970s. I mean, he may have... I, I suspect that when he returned from Sacramento, because he did live there as a child, mm -hmm. he attended uh, Cordova um, Elementary School or Cord Cordova Meadows, Meadows Elementary School or whatever it was called. Um, he did live in Rancho Cordova when he was very small. Uh, but then, mm -hmm. um, you know, he went with the Navy and uh, I think his, his father abandoned the family and his mother mm -hmm. remarried. Mm -hmm. And um, he was living in... Auburn in the late 60s or like Roseville or somewhere in Placer County and then he moved to um to uh, Tulare County to Exeter mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And from Exeter, he moved back to Sacramento and eventually bought a home in Auburn and began working for the Auburn Police Department. I suspect that when he first returned to Sacramento, he may have been living with in-laws, uh, her, his, uh, his wife's parents who lived in mm -hmm. Citrus Heights, like right in the, the buffer zone. Um, right. And, uh, but yeah, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have found an address for him in Sacramento County at any point in the 1970s because he was living in Auburn. Wow. So, so you're, it was just outside of the realm of your circle that you uh, had made. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, I mean, um, we never, it would have been years and years and years before we or I exhausted the kind of um, most likely scenario, the upper layer of Occam's razor, yeah. you know, because mm -hmm. there were just so many names and- Oh, uh, of course, I, it's California. So, yeah, I had digitized, <laughs> I had digitized or, or purchased um, digi digitized files of um, multiple year, uh, not yearbooks, sorry, telephone books and city directories. And I created sure. text files and I used the software utility to cross reference them. And I started developing lists based, and this really made the process easy because right. prior to that, I was like looking through yearbooks and I would look up each mail um, and <laughs> determine if I could disambiguate them because if it was like a John Smith uh, right, without then a middle initial, then, you know, that's pretty much a lost cause. Uh, right. Then I plug the name into public records and ancestry and try to develop a residential history. And if that residential right. history matched, that person would go on my list. Um, uh, wow. I so, think it's so, like, the 70s were just, especially in around the uh, West Coast, mm -hmm. way a lot of serial killers. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Tons of them. Absolutely. And operating around the West Coast. So it's... I can't even imagine having to dig through all of those names and be like, oh, wait, was it Bundy? No. Yeah. Was it <laughs> XYZ? <laughs> was it the cool toolbox killers? No. Was no. it, you know, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. So, um, um, but yeah, so we, we um, I, I had a software utility that would cross, re cross reference mm -hmm. multiple lists. And you know, if you right. have a million names on each list, that's mm -hmm. not that's not manageable for any human being to do. But right. a, a, a software utility would in like would within a matter of minutes spit out a list of you know a thousand or more matches. Um, right. And so then that would that would be a whole new suspect pool to draw from. Uh, right. D'Angelo's name was in the Visalia city directories that we had, but by that point we were le really leaning away from Visalia as being connected. And yeah. Uh, Paul Holes had concluded that they were different offenders. Um, he was one of the few outliers in, among the mm -hmm. uh, key investigators who felt that way. But his mm -hmm. argument was persuasive, which was, you know, n n you're not just looking at a guy from, uh, this is Paul Holes' argument, you're not just looking at a guy that was chunky and lost a bunch of weight. You're looking at people with two fundamentally different body types, an mm -hmm. endomorph and an ectomorph. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at that, expanding on that, in Visalia, looking at the the whole investigative file, you see, you know, people in Visalia, he was not discreet. He was a conspicuous presence. Um, mm -hmm. Witness after witness after witness described these very specific characteristics based on interactions right. they had with him. And they were all consistent. A very specific portrait emerged from that investigation. Whereas mm -hmm. everywhere else, you don't see that. You see right. only a blur. And, you, and mm -hmm. whereas in, in Visalia, he seemed to draw attention to himself with very bizarre behavior, um, mm -hmm. likely encounters with the East Area Rapist in Sacramento and uh, mm -hmm. Contra Costa were unremarkable. You see someone trying to play down their presence uh, in, in a neighborhood. Right. Like for mm -hmm. instance, there was a witness who, um, this is after I think attack number 32, which was in the uh, Little Pocket area of Sacramento. Um, there was right. a woman fishing by the Sacramento River when a man ran by jogging and mm -hmm. he looked at her and he asked, uh, catch any fish? And she said, no. And he's like, oh, my wife is going to be mad. And in Contra Costa, I think it was in Danville, um, uh, a homeowner observed someone standing behind uh, the houses on like a, a, a hill mm -hmm. looking into mm -hmm. backyards. And when the individual uh, realized he had been observed, he kind of just descended the hill nonchalantly and passed the resident and just said, hi, how are you? And kept on going. And that resident wow. followed him a ways and watched him turn up the railroad uh, passage that the Jeez. East Arabis was known to use. So you have two ostensibly very different uh, personalities and people, mm -hmm. but there were also mm -hmm. a lot of similarities between the two cases. So it was really a, it was really a puzzle. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, by that time, uh, I, I really wasn't putting a lot of weight in Visalia. 
right? So you just missed it. Uh, so do you think there's any weight to this claim that he that he has that there's like some entity inside of him named Jerry that was no. doing this and he didn't want to no. do this? Uh-uh. No, I think it's complete <laughs> bullshit. I uh, do I, too. I, 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 I can say that. Um, no, I don't you know totally can. PG rated. Um, no, you but, totally can. All right. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think offenders like this will often try to outsource responsibility to some, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, mental illness. Uh, yeah. And and it's it's just manipulative. And I think that you see mm -hmm. that you see D'Angelo doing this um, uh, in the the uh, the plea hearing. Uh, yeah. And what what he's doing is he's he's playing the the decrepit old man who's just completely oh, God, yeah. out of it. Oh and yeah. Every time oh. he says guilty, I admit it sounds like he's just saying it because that's mm -hmm. what his attorneys want him to say. Mm -hmm. And but that but yeah. and then he's just kind of like falling asleep, and he's doing this to deny his victims the satisfaction of him registering them. Yeah, and you yeah. know that's that's his. Basically, they meant nothing to him. Yeah. Right. And I don't. Right, right. He's someone that I don't think is ever going to be completely transparent um, about about uh, what happened. You know his mo and, and his mm -hmm. you know um, his crimes, and it's really unfortunate because I think this plea deal uh, was a missed opportunity. I don't think that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, demanding that he cooperate fully with investigators other than just acknowledging his, his culpability. Um, sure. With BTK, sure. with Green River, mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. I-5 Strangler, Roger Kibbe, in each of those cases, the death penalty was taken uh, was taken off the table under the condition that they answer any question that any All investigator, questions. honestly, yeah. And that I, doesn't right. be the case with- uh, Yeah, people. no, and, I, and no. that's the thing. I, we see this in, um, in well, Nick's case, Nicholas go to John's case went all the way through, but gypsies didn't. Um, so there is a lot of information about gypsy and gypsy stuff and, gypsy and, and all the things that would change people, I, gra gravely change people's opinions as to what really happened yeah. in that case. Because her, her, her defense attorney was brilliant. I mean, Mike was brilliant. I just, I, I have to say it. He's did a she, great did she defense attorney. Did she get out of jail? Did she get out of jail? Yeah. She, she's not out yet. She no, got a 10 no. year sentence. Um, but all the stuff that would have made that sentence longer mm -hmm. or that would have shown much a much different gypsy than this like american like sweetheart murderer that we have going on right now in the world was all suppressed by her taking that plea deal because you know we have we have so much more information than mike even had because he looked at his documents of all the the all the medical documents that he had and he is the first person that came up with this defense of of an abused child on child by proxy it had only been put in the file one time ever mm -hmm. before yeah. this. And if you look at it all and you go back and you really understand how this all started and, and it began with Dee Dee long before Gypsy was even born. And then you look at Gypsy and Dee Dee as a whole. Yes, there is a case for that. I'm not saying there's not, but there's a whole lot more going on there. And because we ended up with a plea deal, most people will never see that. Now we have a lot more than anyone else because mm -hmm. we did work with the family for so long, you know, and, but, even us, we don't have certain things because, and, and we're probably, I would say out of anyone who knows about this case, we're the most, they're most comprehensively knowledgeable about the case. Yeah. Um, but there will be so much that no one ever knows. Um, and, and we know some of it and we, we've tried to get the information out there. We're working on a series. We've done the podcast, you know, that we did 13 episodes on it where we kind of laid out a whole lot of information. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that a lot of times when those plea deals do happen, like you said, in this case specifically, we're not going to hear the details. We're not going to no. get to no. find out the answers that we really would like to no. know yeah. because he's just not going to give it up. And, oh, and they're not so, forcing him. And they're not right. forcing him. Like, right, they don't feel like they have to. Um, right. I just rewatched the Don't F With Cats. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the end, and he's like, oh, Manny, Manny made me do it. And it's like, no, he didn't. Like, yeah, right. we know that you are lying. You did well, it. We, You're just right. trying to make excuses for yourself. Well, we saw this in the, in, in our, in the gypsy case with Nick and him claiming yeah. it was a 500-year-old vampire that lived inside of him and named Victor. He doesn't have DID. He does not have dissociative yeah. identity disorder. Sure. He just likes to make up names for, pe for the emotions that he has and lay it off on them so yeah. that when, he's, when he is uh, confronted with something, he can go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not Nick. No, no. 
Yeah. That Victor. sickness is that weirdo over there who has now morphed into another person. Like he's yeah. no longer Victor. Victor left the body and now it's this other guy. I'm like, are you that's not how this works. Okay. That's Rachel not Rachel also works. knew he was on camera, I'm sure, yeah. in that oh, interrogation yeah. room. So yeah, everything he said was just, you know, to even we were person. talking about oh. how when he was arrested, he was still a pretty strapping mm -hmm hefty guy it's not been yeah. that long and the the de-evolution of this guy's physical being has been it drastic yeah and i don't know if that's like his like he's gonna he's do it on purpose yeah uh, like, he's refusing to eat. right so i mean it's just crazy like yeah but he looks like this very frail just weak little man and i'm like yeah but your mind is still there dude and oh, yeah. it is just as sick as it was any Absolutely. other day you know yeah. yes um so you guys find out uh, about this arrest, and the first thought you have is is about Michelle and how she's missing this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, I mean, you know, it, the first thought was, "Wow, I, I sure. wasn't expecting right. this this day to <laughs> yeah. come so soon." Right, right. I expected right. it would come, just not so soon. Uh, right. And then, who is this person? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I never heard of him before. He wasn't on any of my any in any of my materials. Um, and mm -hmm. then it was when it hit the news cycle the next day and I saw Michelle's picture crop up in story after story, it really hit me and, uh, yeah. and I cried. Um, and that was really the, the thing that buffered or mitigated the, the excitement of, uh, um, yeah. of this I can uh, understand. arrest. Right, especially considering so much work you'd put in and now like the, the payoff is kind of muddied at this point, right? Yeah. It's, so She's you're quoted as saying, I think she would have had a full book of a book full of questions to ask him, as do I. So do you intend on trying to talk to him? Oh, I think it would be fruitless. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it'd be a waste of time. I don't think you would even see me. Drive, your, um, drive yourself insane with, with the fact that he's not yeah, answering. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I, do, I just, I don't think these questions are ever going to be answered. And they're all pretty mm -hmm. good questions that would, that would yield insights into, sure. you know, investigating similar cases. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, like, if you send him, like, a letter, but, like, do it in the weird way of praising him, mm -hmm. if he'd be <laughs> more likely to be like, oh, somebody likes me, I'm going to brag about my life, <laughs> and just get questions and answers that way, yeah. instead of, because I think that's I don't think it, I don't think the work. thing, is that people want to feel famous and important, and mm -hmm. look at me, I'm awesome. And then they're well, more likely to talk. Yeah, if 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 I were to say anything to him, uh, and again, I don't think I have the platform to reach him, uh, yeah. but I would I would suggest that this is your legacy, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. best thing you can do at this point is to just be open and mm -hmm. help other investigators understand you and other offenders like you. And it's is the only going? positive thing he can do at this point. If if he cares at all about you know his his uh, mm -hmm. his his public image, and I'm sure he does to a degree. I, I mean, mm -hmm. all serial offenders are narcissists. Sure. Um, yeah. But you know. do you know where he's being going to be housed? Is he going to be in San Quentin? Do you know? <laughs> I don't know. Because if Probably. he's in San Quentin, we might have a have a lead on that <laughs> yeah. to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it's like. Yeah. So the um, the toolbox killers mm -hmm. um, and just bitter you know, and Norris mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and so you know it Laura Jacqueline Brand uh, worked with them and more they're so dead now, right? yeah they're but they both died this past mm -hmm. fall and winter mm -hmm. uh, but getting them to like, she got them to give up the location of some bodies uh, yeah. right. before they died and so right. it's and she that largely point, she, yeah. She largely works in San Quentin. That's why I said, you know, yeah. we, may, we might be able to find a person that might be able to do that. Right. But like you said, I think it's futile. I, I don't think, yeah. are you planning on now, like going back and looking through your research and seeing how, oh, yeah, that definitely was him there or, or. Oh, I've already done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, yeah. put it all together uh, again. Yeah. No, but I, I, still, I still do it regularly. Um, yeah. I think there's, there, was a, there was a point where I just detached. I realized there's yeah. not a lot of information coming out about this guy and what is coming right. out. It's mostly not very interesting. And that's the thing. Yeah. These offenders, they spend so much time mm -hmm. um, uh, focusing on their, their obsession and their mm -hmm. fetish mm -hmm. that all the other parts of them are just kind of left undercooked. Yep. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the, the, there's this big empty space where an identity mm -hmm. should be. Yeah. Um, and the most interesting facet of D'Angelo is the fact that he is the Golden State Killer. 
Um, and anything mm-hmm. that's come, come out about him personally and his like relationships with, uh, I mean, we, we know very little about his relationship with, uh, with Sharon, his wife at this point. But right. We do know some things about his relationship with Bonnie Colwell. Sure. Um, the infamous Bonnie. Uh, I feel badly for her having been mm-hmm. thrust into the, the public eye in that way. Um, but I think that she's, she's gotten in front of it uh, in a mm-hmm. way that's smart. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, we've learned that he would engage in when they would have sex. Uh, it would it would, la- it would be an exhausting experience for Bonnie. It would last mm-hmm. hours at a time. He would mm-hmm. ejaculate, and then he would just get up and do other things, and they would come back and have intercourse with her again. And she described his sexual appetite as being insatiable. insatiable um, and some right. of these things make sense in in the context of Golden State yes. Killer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but what I was going to say about D'Angelo, just to finish this thought, um, another reason mm-hmm. I think that it would be futile to try to get anything out of him is he's one of, I, I think, and, and that's the thing about serial offenders, they are highly compartmentalized. And I think yes. he is among the most compartmentalized I've seen. Mm-hmm. That's what's so fascinating about them. That's one of the things mm-hmm. that's so fascinating about them mm-hmm. to me, because I'm like the yeah, least right. compartmentalized person you know, <laughs> right. that I right. know. Um, right. it's, it's like really right. hard. Like when I'm watching a movie, if I have something that's bothering me, um, I can't put it aside and I right. have to see, do it now. I need to yeah, know why. I, I, I remember I went to see Little, Little Women uh, last year, the Greta Gerwig movie. And mm-hmm. um, I just, I was bothered by something that was happening um, in a relationship or something at that, at, at that time. Mm-hmm. And that's all I could mm-hmm. think about during the movie. Yep. And I was able to follow the plot, but like emotionally I was completely inaccessible to that film and mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy yes. the experience. Uh, mm-hmm. And I just wish that, I mean, I have to say marijuana does help. Uh, it does. But, uh, oh, absolutely. You know, that's the only thing. Um, mm-hmm. I just wish I could put something in a drawer and close it. I remember when I was uh, when I was fourteen or fifteen years I old. Had the same affliction. Same. Yeah, I, I, when I was a teenager, I went to see the English Patient, and it was my mm-hmm. first time seeing it. And right. I was playing only at this theater that was like twenty five miles from the house. So my dad dropped me off there, and so I'm sitting in the movie. And about like forty minutes in, I'm really into it. I'm really loving mm-hmm. the English Patient. And then like some some guy's face popped into my mind, and it was a guy that I I knew from somewhere. Uh, like a, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like a guy in his 30s or 40s, had like a mustache and a ponytail. I could just see his right. face and I couldn't place where I knew him from. I couldn't place the context. And it was inconsequential, yet mm-hmm. I could not stop thinking about it. And so right. like yeah. 10, 15, 25 mm-hmm. minutes go by, I'm still trying to yeah. figure out who is this, who is this guy? Yes. And so ultimately I just like walked out. I walked out of the movie and I called my dad. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, um, uh, change of plan. Instead of coming to get me <laughs> like at seven, you have to come get me a 10 because <laughs> something happened right. with the movie and I have to stay and, and watch it again. Right. Um, right. So I was just like walking around the plaza, just trying to think, mm-hmm. who is this guy? And then it, it dawned mm-hmm. on me, oh, he's this dude that walks his dogs in my neighborhood and you know, <laughs> drives by, he just waves and totally trivial person. <laughs> and I was able to return to the English patient and watch it and everything was fine. But you know, it's, it's just, I, it's no, my no, own sense of nature. I'm I extremely really obsessive way. like that. Yeah. My husband, my husband tells, talks to me about it all the time because like if something happens and I'm upset about it or whatever, I can't She's just tell it. one person. I have to tell every single tell person. Yeah. I got to know what and they, I know what they think about it. What did you think about this? What should I have done? What do I do? What do I do now? You know, and I just keep talking about it. And especially with these cases like this, you know, I said, a year and a half ago, you know, when we really kind of took a took a step back about, let's see, what, six months ago? About, about six months ago. No, even more than that. It's been about a year that we took a step back from Gypsy because, you know, yeah, um, been we, almost a year. we finished out, yeah, it's been almost a year. So we finished up the podcast. And we took a, we took a step back and I was like, that's it. We're done with Gypsy. We're not talking about it anymore. We're done with it. She's taken enough of our lives, you know, of time and uh, there's more things to talk about. But it always seems to come back, you know, and I always still think about that one piece of paper that, wait, did that really say that? And then I'll have to go find it, you know, and that's how I decided, okay, maybe if I write a book, like if I actually sit down and write the book or we get the series made, then maybe that'll be a conclusion for me. But I feel that in so many cases that we see, like I am obsessed with specific cases Mm -hmm. because it just, I can't. It's like, I put all the little pieces, it's like a puzzle. It's like a puzzle and it's like the one piece missing and you're like, shit, where is that piece, you know? Uh, well, it's, the answer is out there in the world somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, that's yeah, the most infuriating know. thing. Somebody like in fiction, somewhere knows. <laughs> in fiction, I, I prefer the mystery remain unresolved. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I think it's better that way. Most people right. don't think so. They no, want I the satisfaction do. of a conclusion. Mm-hmm. But I, right. you know, if, if, if a mystery is unresolved, you can go back to that work again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It's, it's just, it's, it's never closed. And so right. it, it's, it's like you look for it again, you look for all the other different things yeah. that maybe will close it for you, but it doesn't. Right. It's, yes. it's like, you know, uh, 
like Hitchcock once defined the difference between suspense and action as mm -hmm. you know suspense is a bomb under a table and right. uh, action is the bomb explodes Exploding. Mm -hmm. and action relieves the tension of suspense and yes. I love the tension of suspense yeah and so if a yes. movie fails to relieve that uh mm -hmm. it, it's it, I just want to Right. Keep re-experiencing right. it. I, I well, like was... being spooked. I don't know. I, yeah. I think that's, yeah, no, no, that's no. the difference between people that like are there are people that are into true crime, people that aren't into true crime, mm -hmm. people that are into horror mm -hmm. movies, people that right. are not into horror films. And I think maybe trauma is the common element. I think that um people mm -hmm. that have childhood trauma are uh more receptive to horror, more receptive yeah. to these these dark hundred percent. And Absolutely. for me, like I one of the reasons I love being spooked and I love horror films is I was afraid of the dark when I was a child. Me too. And while I'm glad that I recovered from that, I, I long to return to that that place of innocence, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I think that horror, watching a horror film, is a way is a way to reconnect with that. Right. Well, yeah. and and what you were saying, like, so I watch, you know, I watch a lot of true crime. I used to watch it all the time. Then I and I always watched, um, you know, crime dramas and and things like that. And one of the things that I had the worst time with was that because I watch so much of it and because I have such an analytical brain and because I'm very logical and I have a researcher soul, you know, that I could easily Predict in 10, it. five, 10 minutes, I'd be like, ah, I know, I already know. I'm going to see the rest of this. I yeah. already know. And it would be a very complete letdown for me in the fact that, yep. All right. I was right again. And I just, you know, walk off, called it, you know, and so when we sat down, my daughter and I, I was like, I want to write a movie. I, I want to write a series about serial killers. And she's like, okay, I'm in. And so I said, but I don't want to write it like anyone else has written it. I don't want anyone to ever know anything. Like I want everything to just completely, as you find one thing, you twist the other way and you turn the other way and you do this because that's the real of an investigation, right? Sure. That's the actual way it happens. I'm like, not the way that this is put together. So we started writing this, you know, and I, that was my whole thing was that all the way I, I went, you know, we were doing 13 episodes for the first season. I said, I still, at, thir at episode 13, I still don't want them to know where the hell we're going with this. Like, yeah. I want them to have some payoff. You know, there's got to be some payoff so that they'll continue to watch. Reminds but... Of, uh, Twin Peaks. Yeah, that's my, yeah. That's my favorite thing. I love Twin movie. Peaks. I grew up so, on Twin Peaks. I had the book, everything when I was young. You know, like yeah. the Laura Palmer Diary. and yeah. <laughs> It's just a beautiful yeah. thing. My husband mm -hmm. and I, we just watched Sinister, um, mm -hmm. the horror movie. And mm -hmm. we typically always, at the at the end of a horror movie, we know what's going to happen. And I was like, oh, that was okay. Like, the mm -hmm. story was good, but we knew it was going to happen. And then that right. movie ended, and it had just a complete surprise ending. And we were like, oh, oh I didn't right. see that coming. Right, right. I, I have a and horror so movie for you. Uh, it's called Don't Look Now. It's uh, with Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, 1973. Uh, I, I think it will hit all of the of all the boxes. I think right I've now. seen it, but I don't know. There's so there's so many th horror movies or thriller movies from that time period that I think I've kind of meshed into one. Yeah. Like, because I can sit. There's one where I have never been able to actually figure out what movie it is, and I have described it to Describe every it to single Describe person. Okay, so it's. It starts off, this young girl is a track star and she's like running through the woods and you see her doing all this stuff and going over all the hills and everything. And so, and like I said, now this could be a, a modulation of a couple different ones that I saw and put all together. So that's why it might not make a sense to anybody. Mm -hmm. So she's a new, they've moved into this neighborhood. She's brand new. She, she makes friends with the teacher, one of the teachers, and he ends up being the serial killer. And he literally, there's a scene that was so in, sketched in my mind of she's in the house she knows someone's in the house and it's not the the um you know the, when a stranger calls or any of those i i've seen them all this one though um she's in the house she knows that the person's in the house so she's called her best friend to come over and he is coming down the stairs and she's like, oh, it's you. What are you doing here? And he's like, oh, well, I was worried about you. You weren't answering the phone or whatever. Da, da, da. And he, she opens the front door and her best friend is like hanging on the front door. And, you know, and, and he ends up trying to kill her and her little brother. And she saves her little brother, ends up in the front yard with him, you know, and they, they finally arrest and she realizes that it's him. And I don't know if he, she kills him or what happens. I do remember him being like brought out on a stretcher. So I think there was some sort of fight between them and she actually was victorious. I can't tell you where this story came from. I have described this to major horror buffs and they're like, I don't know. It sounds like there's so many different ones, but it's not a specific one that I can tell you what it is. It sounds a little like uh, pretty, pretty maids all in a row with Rock Hudson. Um, Maybe. Uh, I, 
seen that in so long. I haven't seen it in so long, but I remember I was sick when I watched it. Like it was one of those times where I was like laying on the couch as a teenager and I was like watching, you know, stuff and I was walk, flipping through it and I found that and I was like, oh, okay, this looks interesting because I love, love thrillers and suspenseful things. That's so good. And I remember watching, and I think the reason that I can't remember everything was because I, I had a high fever at the time. So I was kind of in and out of consciousness. But the parts that I remember stuck with Vivid. me so much. And I was like, oh my God. And I've only ever had that other experience with yeah. a movie like that it sounds really one other familiar. time. Yeah, so Pretty Maids like, what? Pretty Maids? Pretty Maids All in a uh, Row. Pretty Maids, pretty Maids All, all in a Row. Is, uh, is yeah. the title, yeah. I've only had that experience with one other film. It was the same situation. I was very, very sick. And um, I was, I just gotten out of the military, but I was still in the, in San Antonio. And I was actually been, I had like been smuggled into my boyfriend at the time's dorm room that he was in. And he was like, you know, cause he was a military police officer going through training, but he was cycling out. He was going to be leaving. So, you know, he's kind of at the point where he didn't care. And they all, the, all the ones that were like cycling out were like that. So I was in his room, wasn't supposed to be there, but I was definitely I mean, definitely ill to the point where like, I couldn't get up. I couldn't do anything. So he put on The Shining for me. Now I've mm -hmm. seen The Shining before, but there is something you'll, so it was on the time period where it's like inside a VCR, right? So the VCR was set to do the auto rewind and play again. Mm -hmm. I cannot begin to tell you how actually creepy that show, that movie is until you've watched it 10 times in a row fading in and out of like a fever coma I, yeah. he came in and i was like shaking on the bed i'm like please just turn it off just turn it off it's gonna go off now he's like what's wrong with you like it's been playing all day you don't understand <laughs> but um that's a pretty novel way to watch the shining i, I don't know if, i don't know if i want to <laughs> sign up for it but that's certainly uh it was boring. it was very very jarring and it's the original shining you know so it's jack yeah. nicholson shining yeah, which no, is way perfect, creepier than anything else yeah. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, we thank you so much, Paul, for joining yeah, us today. Pleasure. Um, such great information that we got to talk with you about. You sure. know, we kind of get to look at it from a different perspective today mm -hmm. as a researcher. You know, we've had we talk with our death investigators, we talk to our homicide detectives, and get you know, and, and things. But this was interesting because you actually sat and researched it. So yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so for much. Me for, on. I, I appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. No, anytime. Hey guys. So a couple nights ago, we launched a special campaign along with Cheryl McCollum from the Cold Case Research Institute called Love Wins. And what this is, is it is our answer to all the chaos that's kind of going on right now. Um, the chaos from the riots, the chaos from all the different, you know, pandemic, everything that's happening in our lives right now. Uh, all the the issues with, you know, the different lost lives that we've had from before the protesting, after the protesting, so all the lost lives that have come out of this, uh, the lost lives of COVID even. And so hashtag love wins is a movement to usher in peace. And knowing that above all, the only way that we're going to get through all of this is loving each other. So what we're at, what we're actually doing here is we are creating a scholarship fund in remembrance of all the lost lives in 2020 so far and ushering in peace. And this scholarship fund will go to anyone that wants to go ahead and, and enter to win. Um, the criteria is really cool. All you have to do is make a 30 second video of yourself and explaining to us how you lead with love. And we are looking for college age students that are, you know, struggling. Maybe they can't get scholarships. Maybe they, there's a reason, you know, that they aren't available for them or it's just not enough for them. And so this is our way of helping out. We're hoping to raise about $5,000. If we raise more than that, uh, then we'll look into giving more than one scholarship away. The way that we're doing this is we have some merchandise. It's hashtag love wins merchandise. And there's also lead with love merchandise. Uh, they've got shirts, cups, mugs, stickers, anything you could possibly want. And we're going to have it on a couple different platforms. Currently, we're doing some on T Public, but I'm working on some on Cafe Press too because they have a lot more variety of uh, merchandise. 
And so we'll be donating a portion of the proceeds that we collect on this merchandise to the scholarship fund that we are creating. And then we also have a GoFundMe that will be listed in the show notes of our YouTube show and our podcast. And you guys can click on it and you can donate any amount you'd like. And all of the proceeds from that are going to go ahead and go to the scholarship fund. And we'll be showing you exactly how the money is distributed, how it's collected. We're going to be very transparent with this. We're working with some amazing professionals that, um, you know, from like Cheryl from the Cold Case Institute, Stephen David Lampley from the Oliphant Institute, uh, the leading death investigator, Joseph Scott Morgan. So we're, we're working with all of them to really show how much love wins over everything and bringing peace to a country that really, we really need it right now. So that's what we're doing. And we're going to go ahead and play our entries at the top of every podcast and every YouTube until we choose a winner. And our special guests that we have each week, uh, you know, the different people that come on and, and are here with us, Cheryl and Steven and Joseph, they'll all be a part of choosing that lucky winner or winners, depending on how much we end up getting donated. So I hope that you guys join us in hashtag love wins. And we hope that we get some really great entrance because we really want to see how you lead with love. Well, thanks so much for tuning in and dishing true crime with the good wives and murder by design. Don't forget to join our Patreon member club to get exclusive mini episodes, inside documents and pictures from the case, live YouTube discussions, our exclusive discussion group on Facebook, and get some amazing good wives merch. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at True Crime Wives. And for more inside information, check out our podcast, The Good Wives Guide to True Crime, on any of your favorite podcast players. Have a good one from The Good Wives, serving up true crime one dish at a time. <laughs>